Good evening. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to open the um, past president's address and related uh, activities this evening. Um, before we, uh, we start, I want to take just a moment to, um, to uh, recognize and acknowledge and appreciate the attendance of so many uh, international guests uh, at our meeting. Uh, you see on either of these um, uh, screens on either side uh, some of the uh, official representatives of geographical societies all around the world, including here in the United States. And uh, I want to thank all of you for, for being here as, as representatives of these organizations. Uh, if you could please stand up for a moment and, and just be recognized, I'd appreciate it. Uh, it'd be great. These are, these are some of our hardworking friends from around the world. And following uh, the events tonight, we will have an international reception in the adjoining hall. So I hope that you'll, uh, you'll all join us and have a chance to mingle and discuss geography here and geography there and geography everywhere around the world. So uh, thanks. Um, with that brief introduction, then I'd like to uh, introduce and acknowledge Ken Foote, the uh, president of the AAG, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Ken? Thanks, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my role to introduce my friend and colleague, Carol Hardin. But I can only do this by reflecting on this meeting and the tremendous energy and enthusiasm I've seen here every day of the meeting in Seattle, in the hallways and in the meeting rooms and the casual conversations I've noticed even going up and down the escalators. This sense of community we've created within our discipline and is expressed, I think, so well at this meeting, I think owes much to leaders like Carol, whose scientific accomplishments are parallel, I think, by her skills in stewarding the discipline. In guiding, advising, and mentoring across the entire discipline, I think Carol has had a tremendous effect on geography. Dr. Hardin is professor and interim head of the geography department at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She's taught there since 1987. I'm proud to report that she received both her master's and doctoral degrees at my own department at the University of Colorado in Boulder. But before that, she earned her bachelor's um, in environmental studies and ecology at Middlebury College in Vermont. Dr. Hardin is a world leader in the study of watershed systems, particularly in mountain headwater regions focusing on the interrelationships between human activities and geomorphic and hydrologic processes. Her work is concentrated on upland soil erosion, the delivery of sediment to streams, processes and rates of stream bank erosion, effects of different land uses on rainfall, infiltration, runoff, and soil water retention capacity, and trade-offs between management strategies for different environmental services. She's also worked with landslides and snow avalanches and studied the glacial history of part of the Ecuadorian Andes. She currently has funded field-based research in the Ecuadorian Andes through the National Science Foundation as well as uh, EPA funding for studies of watersheds in eastern Tennessee. In addition to having served as vice president and president of the Association of American Geographers over the past three years, Carol is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her work has been recognized with a Distinguished Career Award of the Mountain Geography Specialty Group of the Association of American Geographers, which she received in 2005, a Fulbright Research Fellowship in 2004, and various honors at the University of Tennessee. She's Editor-in-Chief of the journal Physical Geography, a member of the Geographical Sciences Committee of the National Academy of Sciences, and a member of the Research and Exploration Committee of the National Geographic Society. I have to say I've benefited greatly by serving with Carol on the AAG Executive Board over the past two years. She's a remarkable leader, as well as a thoughtful and supportive advisor and mentor. Her address this evening, reframe, Framing and Reframing Questions of Nature-Environment Interaction, takes as its starting point Mel Marcus's presidential address from 1979 coming full circle, physical geography in the 20th century, by examining how, over, the, over time, geographers have changed the ways in which they frame studies of the complex interrelationships that link people and places, but in a very highly contested way. <clears throat> Recent recognition of profound and widespread environmental change has brought human-environment interactions back into center stage. 
Some geographers have questioned critically the very concepts and terms we apply to these interactions. And although physical geographers have a strong tradition of studying the impacts of human actions on the environment, geography as a whole has done little to advance understanding of the complex feedbacks through which the environment or the environmental influences the options and decisions of people and societies. It's these issues that are among those that Carol will be addressing this evening in her presidential address. Carol. Thank you, Ken. It's great to be in Seattle, isn't it? This is a place where the mountains meet the water in the city, tectonics plates meet and people meet, and nature has a strong presence here from the rain which we've seen a little of, to the volcanoes, which we've seen far less of, the tides, the avalanches, and trees. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it's still possible to distinguish nature from society and humans from environment, at least in the big picture. Let me begin. There we go. Because I see the world mostly from the physical side of geography, I really enjoy being in places where the physical landscape is so prominent. And built on this landscape, Seattle is a large and vibrant metropolis, a transportation hub, and a rich meeting place of cultures, from its first nations to visitors and immigrants. For me, Seattle has been a gateway, and my own path to becoming a geographer passed right through Seattle. I was first here years ago on my way to a research expedition on Mount Logan in the Yukon Territory of Canada, and that's where I met the late Mel Marcus, who strongly influenced my decision to become a geographer. Mel Marcus was born and raised in Seattle, so it is particularly appropriate to remember him here now. A few years after I took this picture, or these pictures, Mel Marcus served as president of the AAG. In his presidential address, in 1979, he reviewed the history of physical geography. Physical geography was prominent when the AAG was first founded. It had ebbed mid-century and was experiencing a resurgence. Mel Marcus called upon physical geographers to be more visible within the discipline and human geographers to join them to advance what was then called the man-land tradition, which is so essential to geography as a whole. And you know, we could almost give Mel's address, we could come full circle, full circle, and almost do that again, but, but we really have moved on. Today I'd like to build on his 1979 address. Um, I was going to say I would like to stand on his shoulders, but I think in this room there are a number of people who knew him and we realized that that would be precarious <laughs> because he was so tall. Um, first of all, I'd like to take stock of a few things that have changed since he was AAG president, that is over the past 30 years. And then I'll address the larger question of how geographers frame and have framed studies of the interactions of people and their environments. Some things have changed, some things have not changed. At the time of the resurgence of physical geography, at the time of his address, Americans had seen Earth from space. We had produced a grassroots environmental movement and developed a strong public awareness of the effects of human activities on the land, water, biota, atmosphere. The environmental movement of the 1960s and 1970s came at a time when human impacts on the environment were too dramatic to ignore. There were wake-up calls about the future, such as the Paddock's famine 1975 and Ehrlich's population bomb. The National Environmental Protection Act was passed in 1969, and the EPA was created. And those of you who might celebrate Earth Day next week will remember that it began in 1970. There have been a lot of other changes since that time. Many of the important changes that have affected the questions we ask and the way we do our research in physical geography and in all of geography are due to the introduction and mainstreaming of new technologies. Technology has changed in ways we now take for granted. So, in 1979, computers existed, but personal computers were very rare and, by today's standards, quite primitive. GIS was in its infancy. It followed the availability of computers. The internet was not in public use. We didn't have data loggers or digital cameras. We didn't have global positioning systems for civilian use. 
We didn't have lasers for measuring distance or particle size. We didn't have LIDAR, thumb drives, Google Earth. And we didn't have as many methods for determining the age of Earth materials. I'm sure that you could add to this list. It goes on and on. The developments I've highlighted have been revolutionary in physical geography. Bruce Rhodes, Mike Church, and Richard Aspinall have all written insightful articles about the importance of new technologies to geomorphology and to physical geography. But they're also important across the whole discipline. I doubt that there is anyone here who doesn't use at least something that I've presented here. But I'm not, I, because there's been so much excellent work done about the effect of technology, I decided to move past that. Beyond the technologies, what else is really different today? Well, the scale of our impact. Population has grown, economies have developed, and with economic development has come greater per capita use of resources. Also, human impacts on the global system have become more apparent, and we've become better at monitoring them. Our society has changed, and so have the ways in which we frame many of our research questions. Beyond the technology and new gizmos, our collective views of the relationships between people and nature have changed. For example, whereas much of the research in physical geography 30 or 40 years ago was framed as pure science and understanding the natural environment, and those are still both occurring, but much of the research by physical geographers today is framed in the context of human impact on the environment. So my presentation has two parts. First, I will review how geographers have framed studies of people and their environments, and then I'll consider research gaps and some new opportunities. I was going to begin with Mel Marcus, but then I realized I really wanted to go back a little farther, so I thought, I, so I picked Humboldt. We'll go way back, not just 30 years, but 200. I've lumped much of the early geographical research together in a framing of exploration and explanation illustrated here by a painting based on Humboldt's travel in the Andes. Geographers writ large were essentially developing a database of the world, filling in the blank places on their maps and working to explain their observations. They studied the physical world and also its inhabitants, but there was a certain distance between us and them, between travelers and natives, as well as between people and nature. Well, fast forward to William Morris Davis, first president of the AAG. And as an aside, I must say that, that um, reenactments of Elvis have been so popular that I just knew that as a representative of physical geography, I had to put in a little reenactment of William Morris Davis <laughs> from a meeting a few years ago. In 1904, when the AAG was founded, geographers were still exploring and searching for explanation and patterns. One of the many things we remember Davis for for better or for worse, is his concept of the cycle of erosion. And that cycle and how long it persisted in geography and in our teaching reminds us that, that geography, like other disciplines, and really our whole society, was strongly influenced by the concept of evolution. And it's so important to recognize the very strong influence of that concept on the thinking of the day that I thought maybe the best way to do that is to look at some of the humor of the time. So we have a few newspaper cartoons from 1888, from 1885, from 1908, and finally one from 1883. So representing a span of, of some time, and I think it shows us how, how pervasive this idea was. And, and frankly, some of us in some of our states in the United States in this present year of 2011 are still in this process. <laughs> um, the focus on evolution led to another way of framing human environment questions in geography, and that was environmental determinism, which here I've lumped together with social Darwinism in the box. In this frame, the focus was on the effects of nature on people. And unfortunately, it was carried too far without real objective systematic inquiry. The quote that I've put up here from the writing of Ellen Churchill Semple, and by the way, I'm a real fan of Ellen Churchill Semple, is transfer to the tropics tends to relax the mental and moral fiber, induces indolence, self-indulgences, and various excesses. 
Certainly this isn't, I, I had to search in her writing to find such an extreme example, but, but it, it is an extreme example, but it is an example of the time. And you know, looking back, we tend to be very critical of environmental determinism and social Darwinism, especially because of the ways in which they promoted stereotypes and fostered imperialistic ideas. Even at the time, environmental determinism was rejected by some prominent geographers, and I might cite Harlan Barrows and Carl Sauer in that category. In retrospect, the extent to which this approach was popular became a real source of embarrassment. And one point I'd like to make today is that we were so embarrassed, we overreacted. And for some time, possibly even up until the present, we've done too little to understand environmental influences on people and societies. In essence, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, Richard Peet wrote in 1985 that following social Darwinism prevented geography from achieving a science of environmental relations. We got it wrong once, but we can learn from our history, and we have a lot of new opportunities. Moving to another sort of frame, after rejecting environmental determinism, much of the human environment research in geography was framed as human ecology. Even earlier, in 1923, AAG President Harlan Barrows had made a strong case for human ecology being the unifying theme of geography in his presidential address. It, this has been one of the few ways of framing studies of human environment interactions for which the arrows go in both directions. And an important development of cultural ecology, human ecology, is that it incorporates change and the possibility of adaptation. It has developed into the present framing of cultural ecology and then on to cultural and political ecology. Back in 1980, so that's just after Mel Marcus's presidential address, the cultural ecology specialty group was formed and then in 2002, the group became cultural and political. There's some wonderful work coming out of these groups. Overall, the emphasis of cultural and political, political ecology has been on rural landscapes and developing countries and has been more in the purview of human than physical geography. And I might stop for a second at this point and mention that those of you who work in this area will probably, are probably already squirming about, with my use of terms, and you might notice that I've, I've really kind of trying to step around the terms nature society, largely because they carry a certain expectations, and what I would like to do here is step back a little farther, and remember I'm a physical geographer, um, step back a little farther and, and be a little bit more conceptual. So I'm using words like people and nature to try to uh, sidestep all of those expectations. Probably our strongest frame for examining effects of natural conditions and processes on people and societies is in the study of natural hazards. And in this way of framing our questions, nature is seen as a hazard for people. Typically, this is applied to extreme events. And finally, a dominant way of framing research in physical geography in recent decades has been to link it to human impacts on the environment. Even quite technical, hard science investigations are often framed in the context of water quality, climate change, or various types of human disturbance on natural systems. Most successful grant proposals from physical geographers these days link their hard science to a compelling issue of societal significance. The human impacts way of framing research is valuable, but we should recognize that it tends to be based on a simple unidirectional relationship in which human activity, directly and indirectly, causes environmental change. Let's look at some examples. They're everywhere. Here are a few. Um, uh, human effects on water quality, in this case quite visibly with sewage in Acapulco Bay. Changes to drainage and thermal properties of urban areas, Cuenca, Ecuador. Changes to vegetation, land use, introduction of exotic species, grazing pressures in highland Ecuador and changes to the composition of the atmosphere with resulting climate change. We've crossed thresholds of environmental impact since 1979. Humans are now thought to have surpassed glaciers and rivers in the amount of earth moved intentionally and unintentionally. There are more of us and people move more earth than glaciers and rivers do now. This is from the work of Roger LeBaron Hook um, with one graph being total earth moved and the other one being per capita earth moved. 
And also we recognized that the landscapes of the United States are best defined by, visibly by human activity. We're now at a point at which essentially every place on Earth is affected by human activity, and we can no longer ignore our effects. Physical geographers can no longer study pristine environmental systems. We have great impact, so now I ask, does understanding that change the way we frame our research questions? One renewed framing has been a focus, a re, a focus on sustainability, and I say renewed because one of my all-time favorite presidential addresses was that of Tom Wilbanks in 1994 when he wrote about sustainability. Framing questions in terms of sustainability presents exciting new prospects for understanding human activity as part of the Earth system rather than as seeing humans as separate actors on a stage called Earth. By framing many of our research questions in the past with a clear dichotomy between people and nature, and often with unidirectional arrows, we have only explored certain aspects of the human environment system. We become keenly aware of the shortcomings of these simplified systems when we try to understand and predict what people will do in response to things like climate change. By now we realize that human environment relationships involve many types of feedbacks and interactions. We also recognize that this dichotomous view with nature in one box, people in another, is just one of the many ways in which to view the relationships between humans and environment. Now it is far more mainstream to acknowledge that some of what is considered nature is constructed, literally or figuratively, by people, and to accept that human activity is also a force of nature. By framing our work in physical geography, we must now recognize the extent to which nature is a social construction and the extent to which our perceptions of nature are influenced by human actions, either deliberate ones to improve natural areas, like these improvements in an Ecuadorian national park, or indirect actions resulting from land uses, here the burning of grasses to ward off evil spirits around Wandoe in Peru. Perceptions of nature have received considerable attention from some geographers, but are not often considered by physical geographers. Yet perceptions become very important in environmental restoration and in mitigating environmental hazards. Recent work by geographers and many others calls attention to the interactions between people and nature. In one example is this heading from a 2008 science uh, relating to water management. In water management, changes to the landscape change the water resources. We can't just use historical relationships between rainfall and runoff to produce stream flow in the future when we've moved the earth and paved over the watersheds. As another example, Bill McKibben in his 1989 book, you can see my Middlebury connection here, those of you who knew that, um, in his 1989 book, The End of Nature, noted that we have reached the end of the comforting sense that nature as we know it is permanent. So let's go back to Mel Marcus in a simpler time and a simpler place. Uh, Mel Marcus, in his 1979 AAG presidential address, named a set of environmental problems, environmental degradation, overpopulation, resource shortages and maldistribution, and the failure of urbanization. He noted that many of mankind's greatest problems sit squarely in the geographer's realm. This is true, still very true today. Some things just don't change. Well, last fall, I challenged myself to sketch my view of geography and how studies involving people and landscape would fit into our discipline. So given my roots as a physical geographer, I don't claim to be an artist, I've put physical geography at the top, lumped all of human geography together, and made a third poll for GI science and technical themes. From where I stand, most of what all of us do fits into the central yellow area involving people and earth. It's a real core area of our discipline. So it was with great interest that I read Carl Zimmerer's paper in the December 2010 centennial issue of the Annals. He drew a similar three-part structure. A little slicker, but, but not as colorful. In his role as Nature Society editor, he shaded in certain parts of the interior to locate and highlight the intellectual spaces of Nature Society and human environment work in Annals' papers. I'd like, I'd like to suggest that all of us go visit his diagram with mark, colored markers, maybe crayons, and shade in research areas that are dear to us. 
My hypothesis is that we will find that the shading is lighter in the center than in the surrounding area. That geography in 2011 might resemble a donut with important gaps right at the core of what we have defined as our intellectual space. This then shows us a new set of opportunities. An important gap I see is in the area of examining not human impacts on the environment, but the reverse. The effects of environmental change on people and the complex web of interactions and feedbacks that are involved in these processes. I see far more opportunity here than we have seized. And as the need for this type of research grows and opportunities increase, the opportunity to cost to geography of not bringing our intellectual resources to bear are quite great. In many cases, with soil erosion, for example, we understand the science of the impacts, but it, that hasn't translated to reversing the impact. We can explain the physical processes of soil erosion, but can we predict how individuals, communities, and societies respond to this environmental change? And how well do we understand the social, political, and economic factors that contribute to land degradation and the choices people make when their lands lose productivity? We now find that we have a major research frontier right in our midst. This then is a time of remarkable opportunity for geography and geographers. Here's an opportunity. Human populations continue to become more urban. With half of the world's population now living in urban areas, we have much more work to do to understand human environment interactions at the scales and in the types of places as cities. Fortunately, we have a few excellent role models, such as Patricia Gober, whom we will honor later tonight, helping us turn our attention to urban environments. We need to continue to apply our creativity to the human environment analyses involving urban areas. Calls for our collective expertise are coming from many directions. First, from strategic thinking about the societal issues, issues geographers are in a good place to tackle and I'm sure everyone in this room recognizes this report that came out last year from the National Research Council titled Understanding the Changing Planet, Strategic Directions for the Geographical Sciences. This shows tremendous opportunity in a series of 11 strategic questions, half of which are really in the human environment realm. In another, in another 2010 study by the National Research Council, Landscapes on the Edge Earth scientists identified the need to incorporate human activity into studies of landscape systems. And finally, here is a little excerpt from a paper in EOS, Transactions of the American Geophysical Union, with the Earth scientists really knocking on our door, calling for human systems to be considered as part of Earth systems. Here we see an international call to understand feedbacks between social and biophysical systems in the context of maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem services. And in recent years, those involved in ecological monitoring have recognized the need to incorporate social science into their research. There's especially a lot of opportunity in the area of climate change. And I'm sure all of you were in the audience last year at this time when we had geographers who are leaders of these four different publications of the American, America's Climate Choices panel of the National Research Council, National Academies of Sciences, speaking to us about this. Since then, the, all four reports have been published. While we know that human activities affect the climate system, we get into a complicated muddle when we try to mitigate those impacts, restore the climate system to some previous state, or interest people in changing their lifestyles. One of the great effects of debates about what to do about climate change is that these debates force us to think deeply about relationships between humans and the rest of our planet. In our time, this is a key area of intersection between what geographers can do and what the world needs. Climate change research then presents a broad set of opportunities for geographers to contribute and to lead. Other forms of environmental and landscape change does too. I encourage us to seize these opportunities, and doing so will challenge us to reframe questions we already ask, questions about risk, perception, uncertainty, adaptation, and open our minds to new kinds of questions. So let's look at just a few more new opportunities. There's our baby and the bathwater. We're bringing it back. 
Uh, first, to study environmental influences on society as the environment changes. This will require that we break old taboos, but don't forget what we learned the first time around. Bring new ideas to the table, develop new ways of thinking. Extend these studies to urban areas, developed countries, wealthy people. We might have to study us as well as them. There are opportunities in studying environmental services, many of which are largely taken for granted or have been. Do we understand their interactions? When we work to in increase carbon, to sequester carbon, what is that doing to biodiversity and water, for instance? And what barriers are there to the protection of environmental services? There's tremendous work to be done, and that some of which is being done, to move forward in promoting sustainability. And this is really a place where we can bring the best of geography to prepare for the future. And finally, we have an opportunity, I'd say it's a very strong and important opportunity, to recognize the geographical needs of other fields. And in this case, the need to study humans in environmental systems, and at the same time recognize that if we don't join our colleagues in other fields, they're just going to do this without us. They can, we'd, we'd be happy to help them, but, but they're not going to wait too much longer. In fact, some of them haven't waited at all. We also have, as Dwayne Nellis so aptly put it the other night, many opportunities to really publicly collaborate and lead. And collaborate is the key here with each other and with people in other fields. So even though time seems to stand still in some places, looking back shows us how far we've come. Examining the ways in which we frame questions in the past helps us to reflect on those perspectives and reframe our, new, our work in new ways meaningful to society. Now we are challenged to see our relationships with nature in a not so one-sided, not so simple way, and to consider how we can apply human creativity to create a sustainable future. Our disciplinary history, especially the parts we won't repeat, like determinism, strengthens us. We have learned from our mistakes, and we can move forward to new ways of framing questions about the interactions between humans and the environment. So back in the Pacific Northwest, we have a new suite of opportunities to integrate our full range of expertise as geographers from the hard sciences of physical geography to the carefully nuanced understandings of those working with people and institutions and together to fill critically important research gaps identified not only by ourselves but also by others. The opportunities are wonderful and the cost of inaction is significant. We would be well advised to step up and visibly contribute. Thank you. Dr. Gober is research professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University and professor in the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. She is known to many of us for having served as president of the AAG in 1997-1998, for having chaired the College Board Advanced Placement Committee for Human Geography, and for having co-authored the textbook, Human Geography in Action. Others may be familiar with her writings on topics of migration, urban development, and more recently, decision-making in the face of uncertainty about future climate, especially in the Phoenix area. This Presidential Achievement Award rec recognizes Patricia Gober's transformative scholarship and her extraordinary record of leadership and service to geography. I'm especially pleased to highlight the way in which her recent work exemplifies synthesis in geography. She has shown us and the world a way of bringing together the human, physical, and technical strengths of geography to help advance decision making for water resource issues of urban areas. She was instrumental in creating and has co-directed the Decision Center for a Desert City, where geographers interact with each other and with other specialists and decision makers to address important societal problems. This innovative program links scientists, practitioners, policymakers, and citizens. It links the university with the city, and it links the future of urban Phoenix to its environmental life support systems. The Decision Center for a Desert City was honored in 2008 with a prestigious Prince Sultan Abdulaziz International Prize for Water. Patricia Gober obtained her PhD from The Ohio State University. 
She has been a faculty member at Arizona State since 1975 and has served as chair of the geography department there. With her 2006 book, Metropolitan Phoenix, Placemaking and Community Building in the Desert, and her recent work with the Decision Center, she has modeled an approach to synthesis in geography and connected academic geography to really important societal issues, and especially to the issue of water, which is so dear to my heart. Professor Gober's numerous honors include fellowship in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Arizona State University's Alumni Association Faculty Research Award, and an honorary doctorate of science from Carthage College. She has served on the Geographical Sciences Committee of the National Academies of Science as executive committee member and vice chair of the Population Reference Bureau, as a board member for the Consortium of Social Science Associations, and as a member of the Science Advisory Board of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Please join me in recognizing the exemplary achievements of Professor Gober. Very special thanks to Carol um, and to all of you for uh, witnessing this uh, this award for me. Uh, as I heard Carol speak, I was thinking about Mel Marcus um, and the influence that he had on me uh, for the 20 years when we were faculty colleagues at, at Arizona State. I wasn't a physical geographer, but I was a human geographer, um, always. Um, looking for opportunities to collaborate and to find those dark circles that Carol showed in her uh, in her presentation. I've also reflected on um, some 44 years now as a um, as a geographer, and what a powerful platform that's been for me to explore the rest of the world, um, the rest of the world of interdisciplinary science and the world of science and and, and policy. So I I. I've, I feel great gratitude uh, for my, uh, um, my geographic roots and uh, uh, the influence that those uh, roots have, have had for me in, uh, in, in my career and in uh, creating opportunities for me. So thank you all. Um, thank you, Carol, uh, Ken, Doug. Uh, thank you. <laughs> It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, one additional speaker um, at, at the invitation of the AG's Indigenous Peoples uh, Specialty Group. I am very pleased to um, introduce Cecile Hansen, who is the chair of the Duwamish tribe uh, for, for, for 35 years. Uh, this is the Duwamish tribe is the tribe which uh, lived in the Seattle area when uh, Europeans and, and non-Indians um, arrived and uh, also still lives here to this day. Uh, I think it's uh, appropriate that we transition to our annual reception with um, some words of welcome from one sovereign nation, from the leader of one sovereign nation to those of you here from other nations. Cecile. Well, hello. I uh, thank you for inviting the Duwamish Nation to your annual meeting of AG. I like that. AG, AAG. That sounds very important. <laughs> I want to welcome you to the beautiful, sunny city of Seattle. Uh, and from the indigenous nation called People of the Inside. And that means Duwamish. And when they say Duwamish, they say, well, how do you spell that? Or how do you spell it? A bit of history to take away with you, some 156 years. We signed the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855 with the federal government, with our chiefs, South and sub-chiefs, giving away or giving up 54,000 acres, which today is Seattle. 
Now, this, uh, the promises were not fulfilled by this treaty. However, the Fed settled a suit with the Duwamish, paying all Duwamish descendants the grand sum of $64 to each person for the city of Seattle. Now, I always say to you when I'm speaking about this, I did not go to Europe on that $64. Um, we lost our fishing and hunting rights, guaranteed by this treaty. We then decided to petition to prove who the indigenous people are. Um, we started about 1975, and we languished in the system up to 1996 when we received a negative determination. I cried when I heard that. But we decided, when I advised the consul, I said, I'm going to quit. I give up. Uh, during our session, let's decide to ask our people what we're going to do. We had about over 600 members at the time, and so we, within that time after that, 1996, we contacted as many of our tribal members, and about nine, almost 99% said we'll fight on to prove who the indigenous people are. Now, that was in uh, 1996, and um, on the last day of the Clinton administration, that evening at 6 o'clock in my office, a phone rang, and it was the, uh, the acknowledgement department of the federal government calling to tell me after all these years they decided to recognize our tribe after reviewing our petition. Um, well, of course, we were quite shocked, and I said, hooray, but on Monday, that was on a Friday night. On Monday, we got this vague-looking email saying that they were going to put a hold in that decision by the Bush, uh, Bush administration. And then eight months later, they took away our status. But I want you to know that regardless of the decision of the federal government, which we are now appealing that decision, I always say to everybody, we're still here. And they say, well, where are your people? Well, we're in Canada, Alaska, California, across the nation, and Oregon, and of course, here in the Puget Sound. We are still here. And um, we got a little sidetracked, I must tell you, that um, some wonderful people who cared about our tribe. I was approached by a gentleman who said, Cecile, Remember, I gave, we gave up all this land. He said, I think you need a piece of property. So this gentleman said, do you mind if I kind of look around for a little piece of land? I said, yes, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't think there was anything that's going to happen. And he found a little piece of property, and this man, who is most honorable, um, put the first $10,000. The property was over $200,000. We paid for it. We built a cultural center. The, the cultural center was over $3 million. We paid for the land. And then when I have people come to my cultural center, I say, welcome to the Duwamish Res. And you know what that is. It's, it's our place. Anyway, I just want to let you know that we own two-thirds of an acre. And if you're ever back when you're not working on this wonderful association, please come see us. Um, and um, again, I hope you have a nice visit or you've been having a good time in the city of Seattle, uh, named after our chief. Thank you very much, and it's been a real pleasure to be here and to welcome you properly from the Duwamish Nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecile Hansen, for welcoming us to your land.